Well, this morning we see the only glimpse into the boyhood of the Messiah here in Luke's Gospel. And what an amazing glimpse it is. Even at 12 years old, which was, by the way, the, the likely age of Mary when she became pregnant as a virgin with the Messiah, by any accounts, this was an astounding uh, kind of glimpse into his boyhood. And, you know, it really brings up a, a point that I'm going to make a couple of times during this message, and that is youth is really not a determinant of whether someone can and should be used of the Lord. And neither is age. Uh, we begin the story this morning, the account, with a woman who is likely over 100 years old. And she is also still serving the Lord. So we're starting in Luke chapter 2, in verse 36. Now the scene is that after 40 days, Mary and Joseph have brought their baby Jesus to the temple in order to present him to the Lord. And there's a man that's there while, he is, while his parents are performing this ritual uh, named Simeon. And he comes up and he, he gives a prophecy about this uh, Messiah. And he also tells Mary that her experience of being the mother of the Messiah is also going to come with it, ha have with it its own sorrows and piercings as he described it uh, like a sword will pierce your own heart. So you can imagine the excitement and yet tinged with some fear that Mary and Joseph are experiencing as they're presenting their little 40-year-old baby to the Lord at the temple. And right at that moment, somebody else walks up on the scene. And that's where we pick up in verse 36. There was also a prophetess, Anna, a daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was well along in years, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and was a widow for 84 years. She did not leave the temple complex, serving God night and day with fasting and prayers. At that very moment, she came up and began to thank God and to speak about him to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. And the redemption of Jerusalem that was about the Messiah coming. So Simeon had spoken about the Messiah. And then here comes Anna talking about the Messiah as well. Imagine the shock of poor Mary and Joseph. Here they've just got their little baby. And Mary knows there's something special. But the magnitude of it probably hasn't really sunk in yet. It's not going to sink in when we see the next story as well. But here are these very well-respected elderly people. People who loved Yahweh people who were looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, and here they were coming up to this young couple. I'm sure that the priest who was there was pretty surprised as well. But Mary's memories were of Simeon and of Anna, and it's Mary's memories that we get here in the Gospel of Luke. Luke very probably interviewed Mary, and that's where we get a lot of these stories. But the, So we meet Anna. And Anna, Luke tells us, is a prophetess. And there are several examples, in fact, of um, prophetesses in uh, the Bible. And those examples include Miriam, Moses' sister, Deborah, and also Huldah, who we find in 2 Kings chapter 22. And this idea of emphasizing the prophetess follows Luke's emphasis on women in ministry and uh, in, the, in the ministry of Christ. And, and Anna is uh, just among many women who supported the Lord, both with their presence and also with their treasure. A lot of Jesus' ministry was supported, um, thanks uh, in large part to um, women who decided to come along and support him and be with him. So we know next to nothing about Anna. But there are some interesting clues that we find here in the story that we can piece together a little bit of what might have been. First of all, her name. Her name is Anna. However, the uh, name can also be translated Hannah. Now, if that name rings a bell, last time we talked about the parallels between Mary and Jesus and Hannah and her son Samuel. 
Both babies were from miracle births. Both presented their boys to the Lord at the temple at a young age. Both spent time at the temple or in the tabernacle, and both grew in the favor of God and man. So this idea of this parallel between the prophet Samuel, who anointed Jesus' ancestor David, and Jesus are quite striking. Then we have her tribe, and Luke makes mention of the fact that she comes from the tribe of Asher. Now, the tribe of Asher was one of the northern tribes of Israel. And when the king of Assyria came through Israel, he took away the ten northern tribes in 2 Kings chapter 18, and he settled the tribe of Asher in the land of the Medes. So there, the family of Anna most likely was pulled away from Israel for a long time. Then we have a clue with her father. Her father's name is Phanuel, and that name means face of God. Now, I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail on this, but if you want to check out the notes later on the website, I provided a link to a very in-depth look at the parallels that take place here with Anna. But Phanuel means face of God, and some folks have posited that Anna was named by her father after the wife of a man named Tobit. You may have heard that name before because there's a very popular story that was written about Tobit, who was an Israeli refugee who had also been taken into exile in the land of the Medes. And his story was written down in the book of Tobit. So oftentimes, when the Israelis were in these foreign countries, they would pray a prayer of restoration to Jerusalem. And what they would pray is that God would shine his face on Israel. And so you get this man named Face of God, like a prayer in a guy. Lord, please restore us from this foreign land where we are and return us to Israel. And that's a very scriptural thing as well. Psalm 80, for instance, talks about God, shine your face upon us. So what does all this suggest? What do these clues tell us? There's, a, I think there's a probability that, that Anna's family had been pulled out of Israel to the land of the Medes, but had retained their tribal identity. And there they prayed to God that he would return them to Israel, which he eventually did. And Anna would have learned about Yahweh from her father, Phanuel, who was also looking for the consolation, the redemption of Israel. And so here she is. She comes back to Israel. Her family has come back to Israel. And she's looking forward to the ultimate redemption, the ultimate restoration, which is the coming of the Messiah. She was married for seven years, and then her husband died. And for 84 years since that marriage, she was a widow. Now, if she married at 12, was married for seven years, and then a widow for 84 years, that would put her at 103 at the minimum. Now, that's really old, even from today's standards. I know my grandfather lived till he was 101, and that's pretty good, but 103. And from what we see here in Luke's Gospel, she's still going strong. Now, we don't know exactly when during those 84 years that it happened. But at one point, Anna just decided, you know, I love the Lord so much, I'm serving the Lord so much, I'm just going to go start living in the temple complex. And so she did that. And, and her job then became to fast and pray for the redemption of Jerusalem. Messiah come, Messiah come. Fasting and praying day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, and no answer. And yet she kept at it. She kept praying, yet not experiencing the answers. So just as a side note, this is another reminder that we should not get discouraged when our prayers are not answered. Prayer is described by some as the heavy artillery in God's army sending salvos into the enemy territory to prepare the battlefield for the entrance of God's people. 
And so here Anna is praying, Lord, bring the Messiah. Prepare our hearts. Get us ready. And boom, boom. If you've, have you ever heard a heavy artillery shell? Uh, and probably those of you who are in the military have. Uh, I, just a few months ago, I was down in Salem at the state capitol. And uh, I think it's on Oregon's anniversary, uh, Valentine's Day, interesting Valentine's Day present. But they, they, uh, they set off these artillery guns and they bring them into the Capitol Mall. And the, I was probably, you know, no more than 300 feet from these things. And uh, I, I noticed as I was coming back from, from uh, an appointment that here they were. And so I waited and just because I was kind of curious. Wow, they are loud. And, it, you know, I'm, I was thankful at the time they were not firing off live rounds. I was thinking, you know, what would happen as it sailed over Salem, you know, crashing into some business over on Lancaster Avenue or something, you know, boom, there goes the Starbucks, boom, there goes Les Schwab, you know. But uh, if that's what prayer is like, I think we have no idea the power that we unleash every time we say, Lord, would you please? And then we pray our prayer. But just because we don't hear the kaboom of the artillery gun going off, just because we don't hear the whistling of that shell as it goes overhead, and just because we don't witness the power of the destruction of that shell, doesn't mean it didn't happen. It's happening in another dimension, but it is very powerful. And Anna was one of those prayer warriors and she kept praying even though she didn't see a, res a response, an answer to her prayer until the one day where she's just minding her own business. Who knows what she was doing? Maybe she was praying, walking through the court of women. And she hears Simeon speak about the Messiah and speak to this boy and to her mother. And the Holy Spirit probably quickened her at that moment and said, this is it. This is who you've been praying for. And so she walks up and she speaks not only to them, but it says to all who were looking forward. So I imagine Anna after this day, continuing on in her ministry in the temple and anybody that would hear her, she would say, pray for the redemption of Israel. It's near, I've seen the Messiah. What an incredible, incredible ministry that this woman had. And yet she was 103. I suppose it goes without saying, if she can do that at 103, I know none of you are 103 out there, can we also not persevere in the ministry that the Lord has for us? Now you might think to yourself, you know, I don't have the capabilities of doing a bunch of stuff for the Lord. But you can pray. And a dear sister of ours, Sue, who is in the hospital, she can't get, get around, she can't get up out of her bed, but she can pray, and she is. Believe me, she has been praying for you. She's been praying for prayer needs that are out there. Uh, she told me that uh, she was praying for one individual all night long, and God is answering her prayers, and God is hearing her prayers. And if you belong to him, he hears yours as well, and he answers them. So think about it next time you begin to pray, Lord, would you please, and just think, kaboom, there goes that artillery shell as the Lord's Spirit goes forth to do battle and to bring about healing. So, then we move on to verse 39. When they had completed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. Now, if you remember, they came from Nazareth, which was Mary and Joseph's hometown, and went to uh, Joseph and Mary's ancestral home of Bethlehem to have Jesus. They stayed there 40 days for the purification and the circumcision and presentation of the boy Jesus, their little baby. But then after they got their affairs settled and in order, they went back to Jerusalem or to uh, Nazareth and most likely Joseph continued to ply his trade as a general contractor up there in Nazareth. But look at what 
Luke says in verse 39, when they had completed everything according to the law of the Lord. Four times in this chapter, Luke points out that Mary and Joseph did according to the law of Moses. And I really like that. I pointed this out last time, but I think it's worth emphasizing again. Jesus was unable to observe the law on his own. You can't circumcise yourself when you're a tiny baby. You can't present yourself. So his parents did it for him. But they fulfilled everything that they needed to do. They completed it. Just as Jesus completed obedience to the law of Moses his entire life long, and then when he died and rose from the dead, he gave that obedience to you. He credited to you the good things that he did. And so when we read this here, think of yourself, because you also in Christ have done everything that the law of Moses commanded. And what is the law of Moses? Just a bunch of rules and regulations to make us feel bad for doing things that we know we shouldn't do? Well, there's some truth to that actually, because Paul tells us the law is designed as a tutor to bring us to our knees before Christ because we realize we cannot on our own live up to the law. But the law was basically a reflection of the character of God to say this is what God is like. Now there were a lot of regulations in the law that basically kept summing back up to the Ten Commandments and even, even further refined than that, you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. If you do those two things perfectly, you have fulfilled all the different regulations. And then there were a lot of parts of the ceremonial law, which were pictures of what Jesus would do to come and die, because none of us can fulfill the law. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory or the character, the weight, the reality of who God is. But Jesus fulfilled every portion of it. And Luke makes an emphasis of that right here at the very beginning in chapter 2. So as I said, at some point they move back up to Nazareth. But we skip a couple of really important stories that take place. Uh, one is the visit of the Magi, which happened when Jesus was about two years old. So we know that Mary and Joseph stayed in Bethlehem for at least a couple of years because the wise men came from the east um, and they visited and presented their gifts. Then we also lose the story after the wise men left, God said to Joseph in a dream, get down to Egypt because they uh, are going to try and kill this Messiah. And so then they went down and lived in Egypt for a while and then the Lord told him, all right, it's okay for you to come back, but they wouldn't come back to Bethlehem because uh, a close relative of Herod was over that area of Israel and so instead they went back to where they had been in Nazareth. So uh, Luke just kind of skips right over that. Then in verse 40 it says the boy grew up and became strong, filled with wisdom and God's grace was on him. Again that parallel to Samuel who grew up in the in the great in God's grace Jesus, even as a very young child, had a close relationship with the Lord. It says he grew strong. It basically means he grew up. And in those days, kids didn't sit around playing video games all day. They were out working. Uh, children were expected to work and to help their parents. And I'm sure Jesus spent a great deal of time helping Mary, gathering food, trying to figure out how to keep the family going, and helping his dad, Joseph, for as long as he was alive. And then when he died, probably taking over the family business at some point. We don't know. We know he was alive at least for when Jesus was 12 years old. But it says that he grew strong and he was wise. He had a keen intellect. I really like that. And then again, God's grace on him, that close relationship with God. These two last things are vitally important, as we'll see in the next story. Wisdom and a close relationship with God through his, through his grace is key to anybody who wants to be of service to the Lord. So this next part is very, very interesting. Now on its surface, the story we're about to read here might suggest that Jesus was a disobedient 12-year-old boy. But in fact, he was not. And what this shows us is that God is beginning to set up Jesus' real mission, which was not to follow his earthly parents into the family business, but to follow his father's voice into the life of being a teacher, a healer, and ultimately a savior. 
So let's read this one, verse 41. Every year his parents traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. Now the Passover was one of the three great feasts or festivals in the Jewish calendar. There was the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Pentecost, and then the greatest feast, which was the Feast of Passover. And Passover it took place in late March or early April in the month of Nisan. And it represented God giving freedom to his people from the bondage of slavery in Egypt through the slaying of a perfect lamb. We've talked a lot about that. And Jesus, of course, is the Lamb of God who is going to fulfill that picture. So Mary and Joseph went down with family and friends to the feast in Jerusalem. And it's interesting because this is the only feast that they would go to showing how poor they were. We saw last time how they offered a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons as a sacrifice because they couldn't afford a lamb. This was not a rich family, but this was a dedicated family. The fact that everybody went shows that. Because really, in reality, it was only the men who were required to go. But Mary and Joseph felt it was so important, their relationship with God was so vital, that they went the extra step, the extra expense, and the extra time to load the whole family into the station wagon and head out on a road trip down to Jerusalem, or up to Jerusalem, as they would say, in order to go to the Feast of Passover. Very, very important. Now, um, one of the things that it shows to me as well, the story that we're going to get into, is that, uh, and just look for this as we go through it, uh, Jesus was not uh, one who had to cling to his, his mama's skirts. He was not somebody that had to stay next to his parents all the time. He was a very confident uh, young man or boy. And also his parents did not cling to Jesus so tightly that they even would keep him from fulfilling what God wanted him to do. So it was a nice relationship that they had together. So look at this verse 42. When he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom of the festival. After those days were over, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming he was in the traveling party, they went a day's journey. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple complex, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all those who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked them. Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what, was, what he said to them. So they come, this three-day journey to Jerusalem and they, um, from Nazareth, and they're in a large group of family and friends. And after the festival, uh, it's said, by the way, that the population of Jerusalem ballooned to millions during the Feast of the Passover. So gobs of people. So I'm sure that people set up camps outside all around Jerusalem in the Kidron Valley, probably up on the Mount of Olives. And it was a big camping trip. I guess you could call it the sort of precursor to the church camping trips that, uh, that we take. So they, they had the, the festival, and it was a wonderful, joyous occasion. And then it would have been time to leave. And Mary and Joseph assumed that Jesus was probably with one of his cousins. Maybe he was with Aunt Elizabeth. We don't really know. But that he would come along with the group when it left. And so they went and started back to Nazareth. A day's journey. So then at the end of that day, they probably said, let's, let's uh, make camp, let's start a fire. Uh, where's that Jesus anyway? Where did he go? And they start asking around, you know, he was with you, wasn't he? Well, no, no, he wasn't with us. No, maybe he was with them over there. No, he wasn't. And they went through their whole group and then suddenly realized he's not here. You're the parent of a 12-year-old boy and your son is missing. What do you do? Well, they hadn't given Jesus a cell phone, so they couldn't call him and say, where are you? 
and they had to turn around. So when the group the next morning kept going to Nazareth, Joseph and Mary made a day-long trek back to Jerusalem. And so then they spent another day looking for Jesus. So now we've got the day out, the day back, and then a third day of searching around. And finally, they think, well, we've looked everywhere else. Let's go to the temple. So they walk up to the temple, and there would be normally there groups of religious leaders, scribes, uh, teachers of the law, who would be discussing the law. And they would be there talking about God's word. And so they walk up and they see a group of rabbis that are there. And sitting amongst this group of learned adults, people at the highest socio, uh, social level and religious level of their society, and who's in the middle but Jesus? And he is immersed in this deep and uh, probably vibrant discussion with the religious leaders about the law and about God. And he is, it says, he is listening to them and asking them questions. He's learning. And it says in the next verse that those who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. So oftentimes, the way that this worked was a dialogue. So the, the teacher would ask a question to see what the knowledge of the student was, and then they would correct and they would move on to the next thing. But when the, when the religious leaders asked Jesus a question, he would answer and they would go, wow, I can't believe you knew that. So here's this incredible exchange going on, and Mary and Joseph walk up and they see their son in the midst of it. Now, what would you do as a parent, right? These are like, you know, learned people. They're supposed to show a lot of respect and all this kind of stuff. I'll, I, I'm pretty sure that Mary and Joseph just broke right into that group. They didn't care what they were talking about or who they were. And uh, they just say, son, why have you treated us like this? You know, as a parent, your son is missing. You walk all day back to Jerusalem. You got to make camp again. You're going, where did he go? Why did he leave us? I can't believe he did this. What do you, where do you suppose he might be? And then they, they have a fitful night's sleep. They wake up the next morning tired, perhaps a little irritable. And here they are trouncing around Jerusalem all day looking for their son. And then finally, they're practically at the end of their rope and they see Jesus. So, of course, they're going to go rush right in there, pretty dysregulated, Jesus, how dare you? How could you do this to us? So I can, I can understand and, and from a parent's perspective see why they would react this way. But then look how Jesus reacts. <laughs> he doesn't say, oh, gee, mom, I'm sorry, or he doesn't look of guilt on his face or, you know, hanging his head or anything like that. He says, well, why were you searching for me? Why, mom and dad, did you worry on that first night? Why did you come all the way back to Jerusalem? Why did you get all dysregulated and upset about me treating you a certain way? Were you not listening when Simeon said the things that he did? Were you not listening when Anna spoke of the Messiah? Were your ears stopped up when the shepherds came and told you about me? Were you not paying attention when Gabriel told you that I would be the Messiah? Now, he doesn't put them down. He just very directly points right at the heart of what was going on in their minds. Why were you searching for me? Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? Now, the Greek is a little difficult to, inter or to translate right here, but the, probably the best interpretation is what, the way the Holman renders it here, where Jesus says, I have to be here. This is my mission. You should know that. Yet they didn't. It says they did not understand what he said to them. We're going to see that same theme played out a little bit later when Jesus starts his public ministry. 
because they will think that he's gone over the deep end and they're going to try and do an intervention because they think Jesus has gone crazy. So despite all the voices into Mary and Joseph's life, the words had not sunk in to the point where they had accepted what Jesus was really about. It just went right over their head and it took time for their emotions to settle down. But notice what Jesus does not do here. He does not say, I'm the Messiah. You guys birthed me. Thank you for that. Now you are dismissed. He didn't do anything like that. He didn't declare his independence. In verse 50 or 49, uh, excuse me, 51, it says, Then he went down with them, came to Nazareth, and was obedient to them. I think that there might be a suggestion in here that on subsequent Passover trips to Jerusalem, Jesus didn't stay behind anymore. It was enough that one time, and it was where he needed to be. But notice what effect it has on Mary. It says, his mother kept all these things in her heart. Once again, we find Mary in that contemplative, meditative mode about all these things that were being said. She didn't quite get it, but she was holding on to them in her heart. Jesus goes with them, and he is obedient. So then in verse 51, sorry, 52, we read that in the intervening years between 12 and 30 or so, it says Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with people. So Jesus continued to mature in wisdom, which is intellect. He was a smart kid. And also practical holiness. He knew what the law required and he followed it. He grew in stature, which just literally means he physically grew up to be an adult. He was a normal human being. That's actually quite important for us. I'm not going to dwell on it this morning, but, you know, Jesus became a man. He became fully human while being fully God, and he is still fully human to this day. But he lived life with all the same things that we have to experience in our lives as physical people on this planet. The only difference was he wasn't stained with sin, which, which uh, affects us so greatly. So he grew in stature and he grew in favor with God. His relationship with God was a priority. But he also had favor with man. He was well respected by those who were around him in society. And I want to point something out here. Jesus was 12, okay? He was on the cusp of adolescence. And at that time in a boy's life, oftentimes it is when young boys change into men and their attitudes change, especially toward their parents. Parents become the enemy. Friends become the primary influence and rebellion can very easily set in. But Mary remembers Jesus as an obedient child. Why is that? I think that the key was his focus. His focus was on learning about and drawing close to God. His father, Yahweh, became the dominant influence in his life. Not his parents, but also not his friends. So that begs the question for us, what is the dominant influence on your life? Is it your family, your friends, your culture, your self-identified people group? What is it? I would challenge you to seek this out for yourself and begin to opt for your relationship with God to be the primary source for your value system. Is God's value system becoming your value system? Also, I wanted to point out that Jesus was not afraid to ask questions and about the Lord. He was curious. He was seeking. 
that is a great quality in a person no matter what their age are to always ask questions and to seek out knowledge about God he sought out those who could best answer his inquiries at 12 it was the religious leaders in Jerusalem now I'm sure at some point early on in his life Jesus exhausted his parents ability to answer the questions that they had as much as they loved Yahweh and loved the law of the Lord and had probably studied it a lot and all that kind of stuff he was asking questions I have no idea he was probably giving them insights into the word that were blowing them away I think it would be pretty challenging to have Jesus as your son wouldn't it so Jesus went to the ultimate source of, of knowledge in Israel at the time and I guess I just wonder is that us are we curious and seeking are we trying to find the best answers to our questions and just keeping at it until keep keep digging until we we find what it is that we're looking for so just in conclusion I just want to hammer home again this point that I made at the beginning and that is you are never too young to start serving God even if that just means asking a lot of questions and being curious but by the same token you are never too old to keep serving God even if it's just fasting and prayer and of course there's no just about it let's pray father I just want to thank you for the fact that you keep using us as long as we want to be used and you start using us whenever we want to be used so help us Lord to be people of curiosity about you always learning and always sharing what it is that we learn give us that excitement about your word and about your character and about the gospel so that we would always be sharing that with other people and Lord I pray that you would also give us perseverance the perseverance of Anna who prayed and fasted day by day by day asking prayers asking you to bring about the redemption of Israel and her prayers were answered our prayers Lord is that you would come back quickly our world is rapidly moving away from a relationship with you we know Lord the gospel is as, is as powerful as ever and we pray that you would empower us to bring that light into an ever darkening culture but by the same token Lord we pray as the Apostle John did come quickly Lord Jesus restore this planet to the way you want it to be bring about our final salvation and your righteousness on this earth Thank you for doing this, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.